My name is Jack Gallagher, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Oceanfront Men's Group in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I'm grateful to be alive and sober and here with you all this evening. Um, so far, I'd like Gracie and the guy from the Chamber of Commerce. How about you? <laughs> wow. It's good. it's good to be here. Uh, he's uh, Cotton is right. Uh, I haven't seen my wife in, in three weeks, and uh, we're, se we're in separate quarters right now because I'm in Virginia and she's in Kansas City, so I, I flipped a coin at about 10 to 7 and y'all won. And that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm down here. I was going to going to cop a plea and say that uh, I wasn't feeling well. Uh, this, is, this is real exciting for me to be here this evening. Um, I have not done this and had the privilege to do this a lot, and um, I recently was in Portland, Oregon, or not too long ago in Portland, Oregon, where I had the opportunity to speak uh, at a convention that was at the airport runway of where I took my last drink and was taken to the county detox. And um, I was there with my sponsor, sponsor, Ray O.K., and so I asked for instructions before I come out to talk to you all at something like this. And uh, I said, what do I do, Raymond? And he said, uh, thank the committee, and for God's sake, try not to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so I, on that note, I would like to follow my grand sponsor's instructions and, and thank the committee from my heart, thank the committee for the wonderful job that they uh, have done, the hospitality that they have shown myself and my wife. Um, I have become part of the family, I feel, with Ramona and Shorty. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for stock to buy, buy AT&T. They spend a lot of time on the horn. And uh, I've had the opportunity to visit. And, and the other night when I talked to them from Virginia Beach, uh, having been on the road myself, it was like a, a meeting for me, and I'm grateful for that. It was good to talk with you. I heard folks talking early before we, we got started, and... Um, they were talking about the makeup of, of the area and that, and I'm, I'm from originally from around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in a little town called Bristol, Pennsylvania, and, um, and I'm CIA, which if you haven't noticed, you know, from my appearance, I'm Catholic, Irish, and alcoholic, you know, and, <laughs> and I was wondering if, if in this section of the country there are probably a lot of BIA, you know, Baptist, Irish, and alcoholic, you know, <laughs> not here, it's a whole new sector. I, I grew up, uh, in a manner of speaking, um, in a little town called Bristol, Pennsylvania, uh, an industrial town outside of Philadelphia. And I come from a, what I like to refer to as a fruit-on-the-table Irish family. And, and what I mean by that is that my home, the home of my mom and dad, there was always fruit on the table, but you weren't allowed to eat it. <laughs> now, I don't know if anybody grew up in a house like that. The fruit was for the company, you know. And I was 25 years old before I found out that furniture didn't have plastic covers on it. You know, because that was for the company. I'd never been any, around any regular furniture. I went to the Catholic school system uh, around um, Bristol, Pennsylvania. And I need to tell you a little bit about myself and how I was then. I was, uh, I was short and I was fat and I was funny, uh, and more than anything else, I felt like um, I didn't belong. I grew up, uh, my mother, uh, who, who I lost last spring, always encouraged me and tell me she would wake me up in the morning for school, and I'd say, I can't go to school, I'm too fat, and she said, you're not fat, Jack, and she would roll me out the door to school, you know. And, uh, I was the only kid in my town, I think possibly the only kid in America who ever played little league baseball in a major league uniform. So they, had to, they had to send away to Cooperstown to get my uniform because I was this little round kid. <coughs> and uh, my friend Bill D. in uh, Portland, Oregon, describes my feeling as a child better than anyone else, and I'll use his words. Uh, as a child, I felt like a spaceship had landed in this little industrial town and dropped me off and left and said, have a really good time with these Irish Catholic people, you know, your family. 
because I never felt like I belonged in the family. Uh, going through school, everyone had best friends and people who they somehow contacted and connected with emotionally. And I always wondered about that because I never had that. Um, I had cronies. I don't know if you're familiar with the term cronies. I had people I hung out with. Uh, I never really connected. I can remember as a kid, my dad dying um, when I was about 15 from cancer, and he had it real bad. And I had always been the comedian in high school, and that's how I kept you all away from me and kept other people away from me. And I went to this group of guys that I hung out with, and I said, you know, this morning i got to talk about something really serious. I said, my father's dying. And they got real quiet. And I said, you don't understand. My father's dying. And no one said anything. And I went home that night to my mom. My dad was in the hospital. And I cried harder, I think, than I've ever cried in my life. Because the feeling I had inside of me was that if I'm not being funny, and if I'm not being rude to the nuns, and if I'm not acting out, then I don't belong with you, then I'm not accepted. And I think that that was a, a, a good feeling uh, for me to recognize because it, were, it was to become a part of what my drinking and what the rest of my uh, life was to be like. A wonderful thing happened to me. Uh, it was called the 60s. <laughs> you know, it was wonderful in the respect that I felt like I didn't fit anyhow, and I kept getting huger and huger, and I looked around and I saw these guys who were huge and had long hair and beards and body art and paraphernalia on them and rings and earrings and stuff like that, and I had already um, started to play the guitar, which is a bad sign in a 14-year-old, you know, anywhere, even today, you know. I started to play the guitar and, and hang out around uh, coffee houses and honky-tonks when I could. And um, I took my guitar and a $10 bill and I hitchhiked from the Philadelphia interchange of the Pennsylvania Turnpike to California. I wanted to be in San Francisco and I wanted to be um, with the flower children and the hipsters and uh, that's where I was headed. That same year or approximately that same year I was arrested the first time before I left for California for alcohol and other drugs. I was arrested at a high school beer party, which doesn't seem real significant other than the fact that when they arrested me, I had three bottles of turpin hydrate uh, with codeine in my back pocket at this Catholic high school beer party. And um, two of them were empty and one was full. And when the cop put me up against the car, he said, what's all the cough medicine for? I said, I have bronchitis. You know, so I, isn't that obvious? You know, I should have known then that something was wrong, that something was different with me, because the guys I hung out with didn't drink the way I did. Um, I had a tremendous capacity, like a lot of us, for alcohol. I could drink all day, even as a, a teenager, and not show the effects that other people who had had a couple of beers. Um, my mom and dad were not alcoholic, but they were adult children of brutal alcoholic homes, brutal uh, alcoholic homes, and that's why they bonded together when they met and stayed together all those years. In the, uh, in, in the 60s and in San Francisco, um, I had already set a, a regular pattern for myself of, of drinking and, uh, and using other substances, and one of the things that I discovered right on about my drinking and using was that I would do anything to change the way I felt about myself. I would do anything to change the way that Jack felt about Jack. Um, I was always uncomfortable. I always felt different. And when I drank and when I used, uh, then I didn't feel so uncomfortable and feel so different. Um, I can remember sitting in the bathroom uh, by myself as a, as a young teenager uh, and drinking and looking around uh, like at a supermarket at the pills in my mom's medicine cabinet. My mother was a registered nurse uh, and taking two of these and two of these and three of those and having a few drinks and sitting down and taking my pulse as I sat. 
The rationale for that was if my pulse went faster than I had got into the diet pills, if my pulse went slower, it was time for a nap. <laughs> That's how I worked it. Um, so I knew I was different. I knew there was something about me. We hear a lot today about peer pressure, and, and, and a lot of us look at that and laugh and the fact that I was my own peer pressure. I really didn't need any peer pressure. Uh, I didn't like the way I felt, and when I started drinking and using, that was fine for me. I got to San Francisco, <coughs> and I, um, I found the acceptance that I had looked for my whole life. Uh, at San Francisco in 1962 and 63, the weirder it got and the weirder you got, the more acceptance you found. You know, it couldn't get too strange for the people I hung out with. I could not be too fat for these people. They would just develop a new nickname for you and then you were part of the crowd again. By the time I got there, my name was Jack the Fluke, F-L-U-K-E. And, uh, and that is an unnatural occurrence of nature or a lucky chance, as in it happened on a fluke. And I didn't like that name when I first got it. I really didn't like that name. And I sat down one night with the dictionary and I realized as I was writing and looking in the dictionary is that that, that was who I was. I might not like it, but that's who, that's who I was. Because uh, things in my life, when I showed up, things were different and uh, things were uh, not the same. And I was Jack the Fluke. I ran into a group of people about this time and I was drinking on a daily basis. And, you know, as a sign of the times, anything uh, that came my way, uh, I put into my system. And I had, uh, I found a group of people who would come to be known later on in, in our history, in the history of America, as the, uh, the Merry Pranksters. And, and these people uh, were uh, Ken Kesey and a lot of that crowd of people in the Haight-Ashbury in, in San Francisco. And I started to, to hang out around those people and on the fringes of those people. And I went to work uh, at my first real job uh, for a man named Stanley Owsley, uh, who was a chemist. And uh, my job for Mr. Owsley is that I was a sales representative uh, for, for his laboratory. You know, when I, when I finally got sober, people said, well, what kind of work have you done? I said, oh, commodities. You know, <laughs> what the hell are you going to say? You know, it was the only real skills I had. And I went to work for him and uh, those people. And in the 60s, uh, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of good times. And uh, it seems to me, in looking back, that, uh, that alcohol... Uh, was a constant with me, a regular, a constant. It's something that I needed in my system, but somehow there was enough going on that it really didn't seem like my number one priority. But that was quickly to, to change. I met a woman, uh, a very fine woman, who had lived outside of the city on a little farm, and I had made quite a bit of money by this point in time and uh, was being uh, chased around San Francisco by the the authorities by the police and some of the other uh, federal authorities in San Francisco and I thought it was time to go out to the country and I met this woman I went out to the country with her and she had a small infant child and we would spend time out in Marin County in the country and, and I can remember walking to shopping malls on the weekend out there in Mill Valley and looking at families as they walked down the street hand in hand with kids in the carriage like our kid was in the carriage and wondering myself, how the hell do you get that way? Inside me, I wanted to be um, a good father. I wanted to be uh, a good lover, a good husband. I wanted to be a friend to this woman and, and to this child. And yet my best efforts couldn't get me there. And I would look at normal people and I would wonder, how do you do it? How do you have that kind of a relationship where your face lights up when you walk down the street? You know, how do you get there? Because my priority by this time, every morning and every evening and throughout the day, was what I was going to put into my system. And that was my number one priority. Like a lot of us, um, I went through uh, a case of the nevers, and I won't, go, I won't go through that for you tonight, but I will say briefly, that if I said that I would never do something, I almost automatically wound up doing it. You know, 
as a, as a, a sophisticated guitar playing uh, wine drinker and and reefer smoker, I looked down on the people who were the speed freaks. And as a speed freak running around the roofs of Boston, I looked down on the Hispanic heroin addicts. And as a heroin addict with a one-eyed hooker named Sally Action on East 6th Street and Avenue D in New York City sitting there, I looked down on the winos who walked by our door out there. You know, and watch out what you say you'll never be. <laughs> you know, I should have put the cardboard out on the street for myself, you know, because that's where my story went. And that's what happened to me. In about 1970... I started to hit the detoxes, the jails, and the rehabs. By this time, I was 350 pounds. I didn't have any teeth in the bottom of my head. Um, I had a lot of health problems, as you can imagine. And I went to my first rehab in Stockton, California. A doctor named O'Brien, who has gone on to become very famous in our field and, and, a, and a fine man, did the initial interview on me. At the time, I was late-stage alcoholic, and I was a late-stage heroin addict, and he had his detox for alcoholics on the left-hand side of the third floor of San Joaquin General Hospital, and he had his detox for the addicts on the right-hand side of the third floor of San Joaquin General Hospital, and he instructed the nurse to put my bed in the middle, <laughs> you know, because I qualified on both sides of the hall. And it was during that hospitalization that, you know, in our literature and in our books, we read the stories, and they always talk about those two large men in blue suits who come out to visit. For a while, I thought it was the same two guys, because they'd been to see me, you know. And I can remember these two smiling, large men in blue suits coming into this hospital. And the only thing I remember out of the conversation was that they told me, that I was going to be all right, which proved that they didn't know anything, you know, because I was dying, you know, and that somehow they were from AA and that things would get better, and that's all I remember. I was in bad shape physically, and they sent me up to Murphy's, California, to a little rehab up there that had been a tubercular hospital for six weeks to get my health back and to see if I can get some recovery started. And that was my first time. Uh, with AA people at AA meetings or anything like that and and I don't remember anything about it except the people were wonderful to me and they told me that it was a good idea for someone like me that when I got out of this place that I should find the closest AA group or club or meeting and that I should hang out like my life depended on it you know and I thought that that number one they didn't know who they were dealing with and number two that they had really overreacted you know, I mean, I just spent six weeks in the mountains, you know. I had work to do or something. And I got back to St uh, Stockton, California, and uh, Kathleen, the mother of my daughter, uh, was, was due uh, to have this child uh, very swiftly. And I came back and I said, we're going to do it now. And I called around for about a job. And before 24 hours was out, I had a bottle of wine in my hand. And the... Um, and the telephone, and I wasn't looking for work. I thought, I felt really bad, the, the, the remorse that we have. I didn't know what to do, and I, I remember what they had said about AA, so I called to go to an AA meeting. It was a Saturday night in the middle of July in San Joaquin County. It was 110 degrees like it always is in July in Stockton, California. Uh, as I said, I weighed well over 300 pounds, I had hair all the way down my back that was braided up in a queek with a little ring on the end of it. Um, I have a plethora of body art that's still with me today. And, and I got one tooth in the front and it's black. I got my earring in and they said, here's a meeting, it's not far from your place. And I said to Kathy, I said, honey, I'm going out to the AA meeting. You know, and she went, oh, thank God, you know, go somewhere, you know. <laughs> I got down to the group and I was going to do myself a favor and I walked in the door at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, and it was the business and professional group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Stockton, <laughs> California. All the men had gray hair, all the women had blue hair, and some old duffer stood up the front and said, if you want what we have, and I went, God, I don't, want, I don't want a wife with blue hair. I got one with red hair, and I can't handle her.
He said, is there anybody here who's new tonight? And I raised my hand and qualified, and the guy next to me got up for coffee and never came back. And the, the, <laughs> it's a true story. The seat stayed empty all night long. <laughs> they were drunks, but they weren't dumb. You know, I was a bad character. Between that meeting in Stockton, California in 1970, and I, and I left, and I called a cab, and I didn't get a ride home. And be, between that meeting in 1970 and the um, hospital, Physicians and Surgeons Hospital in Portland, Oregon in 1980, I was institutionalized, hospitalized, uh, jailed, halfway housed, detox center, Christian daycare center, 75 times. I didn't know that until I followed the steps of our program and, and took an inventory and, and we don't have time nor do I think it's necessary uh, to go through uh, what that 10 year period of my life was like. But I will tell you this, that during that period of my life I managed to, to give away and to hurt and to walk away from all that was dear to me all those who love me, um, anything that vaguely um, resembled my past, the positive parts of my past I walked away from. Um, during that period of time, I was to find out that the place that I was most comfortable uh, in this world was on Skid Row. And the reason that I was most comfortable there was not just because of the alcohol, but the fact that you didn't have to be responsible to live there. And that the people who I lived there with didn't have families. There aren't any children on Skid Row. There's not a lot of women, at least where I was. And I was real comfortable being in those surroundings with men um, who were on the same path that I was, and that was to death. Um, at certain periods of those 10 years, um, I started going to, uh, to mental hospitals instead of the, there weren't all those, that many detoxes and, and that around, they were just starting up and I started going to, to mental hospitals and uh, I will tell you this evening that um, I'm an alcoholic who loves mental hospitals. <laughs> mental hospitals are the only place in America where alcoholics have any real status except here, you know, <laughs> because at least you're not crazy, you know. I used to consult with the physicians in the morning about other patients. You know, I'd say, I'd say, Dr. Bill's not looking too well this morning, is he? You know, because I wasn't crazy, you know, and Bill was crazy. I got real comfortable going to institutions, and I got real comfortable in the hospitals, and I knew how to play the game, and, and, uh, and I really thought that that would be my life until um, the institution stopped taking me. They didn't want me anymore. I was a revolving door patient, and they they made it real tough for me to get in. About that time, I, I tried to uh, get myself cleaned up and I was unsuccessful and I was both back into the dual addiction again of the booze and, and, the, and the heroin and um, I got picked up in Boise, Idaho in, in a fit of desperation uh, for an alcoholic arm robbery and I'll explain that to you. Uh, I was picked up for robbing the largest hotel in Boise, Idaho in a drunken stupor coming down after being four days in a flea bag hotel room with uh, delirium and, and on the verge of convulsions. I got picked up for robbing that hotel uh, with a Zippo lighter. <laughs> when I came to this program, I thought I was a criminal. I've been sober long enough to know that I was a nuisance is what I was. They took me away, um, and during that initial part of that incarceration, uh, I started to, uh, to go into DTs, and I stayed uh, in a solitary cell in Boise, Idaho, and stayed in DTs for almost three days, and on the third day, um, I became somewhat lucid, and I ripped apart the indestructible mattress, and I made a noose, and I hung myself uh, from a jail cell uh, in Boise, Idaho because I couldn't stand to live like I was living anymore. They came in and cut me down, took me to a psych hospital, wrapped me up in um, handcuffs, 
put me on a plane and took me to a, a psych hospital in the far western part of the state of Idaho. And I was at that psych hospital for less than a week before I was hiding my pills and hustling money and sending a runner downtown to get me a pint of vodka in the afternoon so I could make it. I was incapable of telling the truth. Um, I was a user of pe people. I thought that all of America, if they had the opportunity, would live the way that I lived because I didn't know another way to live. When I came to you, I wasn't so afraid of not drinking and not using. But I was terrified that I wouldn't be able to live like other people, like you. That was my fear. I got myself, um, after a couple of years, as a guest of the state of Idaho, gracious host, um, I moved back and I saw Mr. Bill S. was here earlier, and I told him that I, I went on the lam and, and used my grandmother's name, Sullivan, for a number of years, and I wound up becoming what they talk about in our book, uh, a booze fighter. I was someone who would, who would fight not to drink. I would go uh, to any personal lengths, and I want to underline that personal lengths, by myself, not to drink. I hung out in bars, and when I hung out in a bar, everyone knew that Jack Sullivan didn't drink alcohol. And it was an ego thing with me. It had nothing to do with sobriety, recovery, or even being dry. Um, and that's what I became, a booze fighter. I put a, couple of, uh, put a couple of years almost together without a drink, and I continued to use other substances on the weekend. And I met a woman in Seattle who was to become my friend and, and is my friend today. Um, and she took me off a of skid row. Uh, I had been living and working at the Salvation Army uh, on King Street in Seattle. i uh, been there for over a year. And I was doing pretty good for myself. I wasn't drinking any alcohol. And I was starting to see this woman. And she lived in society like you did. And I thought, well, if she loved me and she liked me, maybe there was a chance for me to live like you. So I started uh, running around a little bit with her. She, um, she got pregnant. And I had put, as I said, almost this two-year period together with very little alcohol. And uh, it was my biggest priority. Of course, I couldn't come to AA. I couldn't look for a, a higher power or a God in my life. I was strictly on my own, the way I had been all my life, strictly on my own. And I went uh, to Seattle, and I assisted her. I, I wanted to marry her, and she said that uh, that wasn't what was in the cards right then. And I said, if you want to have this child, I'll work three jobs and do whatever it takes so that we could be a family, uh, back to that same old feeling of trying to get that thing that other people had. And she opted to have an abortion, and I said that I would support her through that. And I did for three days in Seattle and got her straightened around and home to her mom. And I went back to Portland, Oregon, and I stopped at a friend of mine's house who lives on Skid Row, um, old-time, late-stage musician, alcoholic, and when I stopped by there, if I had a couple of bucks, I'd always bring him a jug because he never had any money. And this day when I went by his house, I brought three. And as I sat them down in front of him, I sat cross-legged on the floor, and I took the top off of the bottle, and I went to take a drink. And this man, who is dying in front of me from alcoholism, grabbed me on the wrist and said, For God's sake, don't. Because he knew what it was like for me when I drank alcohol. And that very day, if he would have taken a 45 pistol and put it in the middle of my forehead and cocked it and said, Jack, when you finish that drink, I'm going to blow your brains out, I would have drank it. Because I needed some relief. And I didn't have anywhere to get it. The pain inside of me, the pain of a life of, of garbage, the pain of the people I had hurt, the pain of this woman who I couldn't connect with even though I wanted to more than anything else was too much for me and I needed relief. And I went to the only, the only thing that I knew, and I drank. I stayed drunk for two weeks in a little houseboat on the Columbia River in Portland, Oregon, and somehow wound up in the middle of an ice storm with no bottom teeth and a, a pair of girls' tennis shoes on, having soiled my knickers 
on the runway of the Portland International Airport and two cops picked me up and they looked at me and they, they, they knew who I was. You know, just like you know who I am today, they knew who I was then. They took me to the county detox, which was no new experience for me. And the people at the county detox were kind to me and loving to me and kept me from going into seizures. And it was suggested to me while I was there by a social worker that maybe I go to treatment at this hospital. I knew the Father Martin films word for word. <laughs> you know. I mean, Betty Ford wasn't sober yet, but I would have been there had she been sober. I mean, I had made the rounds. I had been to the treatment centers. I talked about my feelings in the groups. You know, I had, you know, I had, uh, you know, done all the stuff that they suggested except continue to go to meetings and stay sober. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> but I was, I was hurting so bad and I was in physically in such bad shape. I had wine sores on my feet and legs and I was real obese again and uh, no teeth and all that stuff. So I let them put me in this hospital in Portland, Oregon under an assumed name, a welfare patient under an assumed name, John, John Sullivan. I wanted to keep in the family, Bill. You know. When I was there, the counselor told me, as all the good counselors do, he said, you know, pal, while you're here, you're going to have to go to three AA meetings a week, you know, if you, and, and not ones in the hospital, but outside. The fellows will walk up there and you'll go up there with them. And, I mean, that was no problem for me. By this time, I had been to all those institutions. I had gone to the AA meetings in the nut house and in jails and, and all those places. You know, I still remember the guys from Stockton, too, you know. And um, I said, I'll go to the three AA meetings. That's fine. <laughs> About the third time I went to an AA meeting, I, I went to a group that was called the Happy Hour Group uh, in Portland, Oregon. Met at 6 o'clock every night, 365 days a year. And if there was a sign that you could put over the top of the happy hour group, it's from our book, and the sign should have been, we are people who normally don't mix. <laughs> the happy hour group was put together before the live and let live groups and the gay clubs in Portland, Oregon. It was put together uh, by a combination of defrock Jesuits, bikers, uh, fallen away priests, uh, radical feminist lesbians, uh, you name it, and they were at the happy hour group, you know, every night at 6 o'clock. It was the dead of winter. No one had any money. Uh, it was the weirdest combination of people I'd ever seen in my life, and I was no prize, you know. <laughs> the neighborhood that the happy hour group met in had four or five halfway houses for mental institutions, and there were people there on, an, on a nightly basis whose alcoholism was a third or fourth notch down the diagnostic ladder. You know, these people were a lot of other things before they were alcoholic, you know. We had members who made boxes in the air and would take them and sit down, and I loved it. I loved it. They didn't have to tell me to come back. I'd been there my whole life. <laughs> These were my people. About the first week, I went to the happy hour group, and like a lot of us, I was scared and paranoid, and I thought all the guys with suits on were FBI and found out later that some of them were, you know, <laughs> and they were there for the same reason I was, you know. Um, I was scared and sick and paranoid. And um, I saw a man who I recognized from Damage State Hospital in Portland, Oregon. And his name was Larry, and he had never made it to the alcohol and drug ward. Larry was always on the psychotic ward, and his uh, diag diagnosis was catatonic. Now, Larry was 6'5 or 6'6 and weighed 300 pounds. He was a huge man. He was a young man, and he reminded me of the Indian in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Chief Bromden because Larry's job at the mental hospital was to stand in the corner in this hallway and to patrol the hall with his silence. And he would stand there all day. And I saw this man at the front table at an AA group in Portland, Oregon, and they called on him that night, and he said, my name is Larry, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and the reason that I'm sober and alive tonight is that somehow God gave me some personal honesty in my life.
I went back to the hospital and that's all he said and he passed and I went back to the hospital that night and, and shuffled back down the four or five blocks to the hospital and I sat on the side of the bed and it was as if a shade had been taken from the front of my eyes and for the first time in my life I got an opportunity to take a look at my, what my life was really like. And what my life was really like was that I was a chronic, late stage alcoholic. I was morbidly obese. I was a late stage drug addict. I didn't have the dignity of using my own name. I'm sitting in another hospital in somebody else's pajamas, a welfare patient, bumming cigarettes off the guy in the bed next to me without one human being in America who wanted to hear my voice on the other end of the telephone. And that's who I was. And what that did for me is I got a chance to pull that right back down because it was too painful, but it gave me a chance to start in our program. I took that five minutes on the side of the bed and I realized that somehow if I were to find anything in this life, if I were to find a life beyond that day in the hospital, that it was going to have to be with you that the treatment centers were wonderful and that they would help me physically, but if I was to find a life, it was going to have to be with you. I snuck out of the treatment centers to go back to AA. I snuck out. I missed lunch. I skipped breakfast. I do whatever I had to do to walk those four blocks with the wine stores on my feet so that I could sit in a room with you because I knew that somewhere inside of me that there was a spark that wanted to live. I didn't feel it a lot, but somewhere inside of me, there was a peace left that wanted to live. I became a member of the happy hour group, a wonderful group of people. I was afraid to drink the first six months. The radical feminist sect said that they would get me, you know, they would, you know, you drink and Big Hat Mary's going to kill you, you know. We put too much time in on you, fatso, you know. You know. You know. That's how they treated me. And the women in Alcoholics Anonymous would come to me looking the way I did and smelling the way I did, thinking the way I did, which is worse than the way I looked and smelled, you know. And a woman came to me one day, three or four months sober, at the, at the club there, at the happy hour group, and she took me by the hand and she said, you have the most beautiful eyes for a man. And as sick and desperate and hateful of myself as I was, I took that and I put it away inside my pocket and I held on to it. And on days when I wanted to die and on days when I wanted to drink and on days when, I, when there was nothing in this world that was attractive to me, I would think about that woman who was okay and said that I had beautiful eyes. I had uh, a lot of prejudice when I got here, like people from my generation. Uh, we claim to be peace, love, and brown rice, and to love everybody, when the fact of the matter is, is that we were very prejudiced about people. My own personal prejudice uh, was against suits. <coughs> if there's a psychiatrist here tonight, and I'm sure there probably is, uh, you can ask him to define that for you but I had a real suit phobia. Uh, anybody who was dressed up or looked like they were okay, uh, I stayed away from. Um, I also didn't like people who, who didn't use bad language uh, or talk with their fingers. <laughs> I didn't trust them. You know. You see the kind of meetings I went to. And there was a man in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was everything I had run from in my whole life. I, I, he was a transplant. Uh, not literally, but figuratively, from that first uh, group in San Joaquin County. He had silver white hair that was piled way up on his head, and he wore his shirts way open, to, and, he, and the white suits, and he had the little praying hands down on the front of him, and these steel blue eyes and white shoes, and he, the white tornado, you know, and he sold insurance and drove a big Lincoln and had a pistol under the seat of the Lincoln that he showed me one or two times, you know, <laughs> and his name was Dell. And he was everything I had run from, you know, in my life, you know, right there in front of me. And he'd see me and he'd say, how are you doing today, man? I'd say, oh, God, it's him again, you know. <laughs> you know he's got a suit on. He looks clean. 
you know. How are you doing today? Because they watched me at that group like a lot of us do. They watched me and saw what my priorities were. And uh, he'd shake my hand and I'd take my hand away and there'd be a $10 bill in my hand. He'd see me out behind a club and he'd put, put, a, put an arm over the back of me and I'd, I'd make my way back to this little flea bag room and there'd be a $20 bill in my pocket. What do you do? What do you say? You know. He loved me. He loved me. And he loved me because I was like him. I came back because I had to come back. I came back because there was no place for me to go. I came back because I wanted to come back. I came back because you were here. They suggested to me that I find a man to sponsor me if I was going to change. Uh, I believe that there are people who come to our fellowship, and this is my own opinion, uh, whose lives don't need the kind of change that mine did. And the kind of change that my life needed was a complete drastic overhauling, a 180 degree turn, top to bottom, um, no corners missed. And I found uh, a man to be my sponsor. Uh, after asking three people who all said no, <laughs> yes sir, once again, no dummies around there. And I found a man to be my sponsor and to help me begin the work of change uh, in our steps. I was powerless and I knew I was powerless. Uh, I, I didn't have a life to be unmanageable. I was waiting for some unmanageability. You know, <laughs> When you come in with as little as I had, there's nothing to be unmanageable. I mean, I had a big book, a flea bag room, and a set of clothes to make it back and forth to the meetings. You know, I mean, what's to screw up? You know, <laughs> you know. When they talked about the second step, I, like a lot of us, thought that it was the, I used to be crazy when I drank and used, and now I'm not crazy anymore. And I spent a long time with that particular interpretation of the second step until it was pointed out to me by a man, um, a sponsor, that the second step of our program had to do with God. I had failed to see that. Uh, I saw the insanity, but I didn't see the came to believe. I had believed for a couple of years, for two years, that the happy hour group of Alcoholics Anonymous would keep me sober and keep me clean and keep me alive. But I had not ventured out beyond the happy hour group as a higher power and working with this man in the second step, I realized that if I was going to stay around here, that I was going to have to make a decision and come to believe in a power greater than myself. I didn't know what to do like a lot of us on a daily basis, you know. People talked about turn it over, you know, the third step. What do we do with the third step? You know, having been from the 60s and taking more psychedelic drugs than I like to talk about, uh, I thought that it was a voices step. You know, that if I said the prayer that's in the book in the morning by myself in the room, that I would hear the voices that would say, Get a job, Jack. <laughs> you know. What the hell did I know? You know, people say, well, I had these problems in my life. I turned it over. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how to do it. A man named George C. used to sit next to me in a meeting. He says, here's what you got to do. I want you to go home every morning and get down on your knees, which was a new concept because I was a shower prayer. You know, God doesn't come in the shower. I found that I had to get down on my knees and take the first, second, and third step of our program every day. And with the difficulties in my life, I had to read our book and start to try and turn my will and my life over to this power of God in my life. I did an inventory with the help of a sponsor, and you've heard quite a bit of it here this evening, and there were parts of the inventory that I had never told another human being. What I wanted more than anything was to change. I somehow realized that I couldn't stay with you. I couldn't stay with you unless I changed. The garbage of my past was too great to sit in meetings and not to get it out on paper and to give it to someone else. There was too much there. 
I didn't have that kind of strength anymore to sit around with all that pain and all that garbage. So with my sponsor, I took the inventory as suggested. I looked around, like a lot of us, for someone to take the fifth step, and I was afraid of my sponsor, so I wasn't going to take it with him. And he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he might get go, go and get drunk and tell people some of the illegal activities that were in this thing. And having been a fallen away Catholic of years past, um, I went and looked for a priest to do my fist step with. You know how the word gets around meetings, you know, of who's good to do a fist step with? Well, the top of the hit parade at our particular group was Father Bill, you know. Father Bill was young, he had a great parish, he knew a lot about AA, he could keep his mouth shut, he'd give you the seal of confession, and he would schedule you to do a fist step, you know. So Father Bill, I called him up and he said, come over, and I went to do the fist step. And in that fourth step that I carried over there, there were a couple of things that I swore that I wasn't going to tell to Father Bill. As a matter of fact, the night before, I had looked at this one particular page, and I put it in the back of about 15 or 20 pages, and I said, I can't tell him that stuff. I couldn't tell him. Couldn't tell him. Wouldn't tell him. I rode over on the bus, and when I got there in the rectory, I sat down, introduced myself. He said a prayer and sat there. I opened the folder up. And the stuff that I wasn't going to tell Father Bill was right on the first page. <laughs> I went through the fifth step with Father. And what happened to me more than anything is when I took the fifth step of our program is I felt like a member and not a guest. I... Uh, a week or so later, after the fifth step, the man who had directed me to Father Bill came up and he said, you know Father Bill? I said, well, sure, I took my fifth step with him. He's a great man and a good priest. You know how we are, full of shit, you know. <laughs> and a good priest, you know. He said, well, yeah. He said, I thought I'd tell you that he's not Father Bill anymore. He's just plain Bill and he's planning on getting married and he's going to AA meetings in Beaverton, Oregon. I said, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sick enough to think that it was me that did it. But I flirted with the idea for a minute. <laughs> for the next six months, I would look before I would go into a meeting to make sure that Father Bill, now, you know, member Bill, was not there. <laughs> I needed the relief like a lot of us needed the relief, and I went and I went back as it's instructed in the book and did the sixth and seventh step uh, upon going home and finding a quiet place. Um, I had been foolish and given Father Bill my fourth step and he burned it or flushed it or whatever people do with those things. And, um, and then I had to go back and make the list all over again. If you're new and haven't done your uh, fourth step or in process of doing your fourth step, keep the list. <laughs> <laughs> keep the list. A lot of pain again. And I went back and did that. And my sponsor helped me with it. Um, I'm a pretty good writer. And I've always liked the written word. So when it came to the ninth step, what I did was I wrote a series of very eloquent and beautiful letters. And I was so proud of myself, you know, as only we can get. And I took them to my sponsor and I said, well, Don, what do you think of these? You know, these are my amends letters. He said, did you hurt these people in person? I said, yeah. He said, make amends in person. <laughs> He said, Dr. Bob didn't go around mending fences with the postman. He went out and talked to people. So I went to California and I went to Seattle and came back to Pennsylvania as time and finances permitted, but I did a lot of it in the first year and year and a half uh, because I had a good sponsor and once again, I needed to change. I needed to change. I'm someone who, as a compulsive liar for years and years, uh, has taken great advantage of the tenth step of our program. Um, I thought it was the sorry step, you know. I thought it was, and when we were wrong, said we were sorry, you know. <laughs> and having had years of anesthetist, you know, and, and, and being dead emotionally, and uh, being on the border of not having any of those uh, guilt feelings, you know, which is a scary place to be, uh, I wasn't sorry about very much. I really wasn't. I, ha I wasn't well enough to be in touch with, uh, with sorry. Uh, so my sponsor helped me and he said the 10th step was about being wrong. 
and he said that when I lie to someone, what I have to do is go back to them immediately uh, and to tell them that, hey, you know, I just lied to you, and I was wrong to lie to you. And it's great exercise for a compulsive liar. You know, two or three or four times with the same person telling them that you just lied to them, it's like, ah, oh, please. I can remember remember getting 25 cents too much change in a little Chinese restaurant in Portland, Oregon and waiting for the guy to open up the next day with the two bits in my hand and this Chinese guy looking at me like I was from Mars, you know, I said, no, I'm in AA and here's the 25 cents, you know, I'm sorry, you know. But it helped me and I grew and I started to change. I moved on from the, the basement meetings and the meetings with the tough talk and the, and the wild times uh, to meetings where people uh, were actively involved in the steps on a daily basis and I went to a lot of step groups and uh, I, I tried to change the way that I talked and I tried to, uh, to look at people who are role models in this program. I looked at the other men who were role models and, and that was what it was for me. I would look at someone, how they carried themselves and say, geez, you know, I want what he has, you know, and I'd follow those men around and slowly things changed for me. I was content, you know, I said on the way over with Cotton that I was content the first couple of years of my sobriety with what was happening with me. It was better than I'd ever felt in my life. I figured that I would wind up being some kind of uh, urban guerrilla AA member, you know, uh, with a, with a little leather cover on my big book, you know, going to midnight meetings, you know, and, and sponsoring other guys off of Skid Row. And that's what I thought that God had in store for me. Um, I, I still hadn't had any job skills. I started to go back to work in music a little bit. And my first uh, real job, uh, aside from flipping burgers at the AA clubs, is I got a job as the doorman at Louis La Bamba Club in Portland, Oregon. Louis was a punk rock club. Um, I didn't fit in anymore. <laughs> Go to work in my tuxedo. And, and um, I worked a number of jobs, little menial jobs around town. And I heard a woman, and this was important to me, real important to me. I heard a woman in an AA meeting say that your wildest dreams can come true in this program. And I knew this woman and I believed her. And she said, stick around here and your wildest dreams can come through in this program. And I had some dreams. You know, I had started to have some dreams. And uh, I told a guy one time that I liked acting and I liked the theater. And he put me in touch with another person and I took a couple of classes. And the next thing I knew, I got a play, a part in one of the West Coast premieres of a very important play. And I got the part. <laughs> and uh, the director said, you're awfully good. And, and I got another part in another play. And pretty soon, I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was working in the legitimate theater and bringing home a paycheck, you know. And your wildest dreams can come true in this program. I had always wanted to see um, Alaska, and I had worked around boats, and I had been a fisherman uh, in Sausalito, California. And uh, I went clean and sober, my third year sober, uh, to uh, Alaska and I fished for a season with the Native American salmon fleet up there and had a beautiful time uh, clean and sober and going to meetings uh, with the natives uh, in Alaska because this woman told me that my wildest dreams could come true in this program. I said that I would never work uh, in the, the field of alcoholism. I had a speech about people who worked in the field of alcoholism I would tell you that speech, uh, whether you asked me or not, about people who worked in the field of alcoholism. And God had other plans for me. And I went back to my neighborhood where I got sober and I used to volunteer at this hospital and 12-step people there. And they asked me if I would take a job as the detox counselors because they needed help with the really sick ones. And I said that I would do that and I would be the detox counselor. That was five years ago. I had to go out with a friend of mine that had a J.C. Penney's credit card and put my bib overalls aside and get myself a wristwatch, which I have on this evening, um, a pair of khakis and a sport coat, uh, the first that I had ever had uh, in my adult life. Um, I also found out that uh, there had been a new fashion trend in America that had passed me by. Uh, it was called underwear. I, uh, 
1960s, no say habla, the underwear, you know. Got myself some drawers and socks. You know, I know that there's other people in, in here this evening, the brothers and sisters here this evening, who had that same first, you know, first time. And those firsts were important to me. And I can remember going home with my first paycheck, and my sponsor said, he said, your job, Gallagher, is to uh, not drink and use on a daily basis to get to a meeting every day and to keep a roof over your head without lying or stealing. And they were my priorities for the first two or three years that I was sober. In this uh, detox counselor's job, I started to go out and to do some speaking for this hospital and to do some teaching. And, and when I came up tonight and saw, saw the blackboard here and I had the, the, but, the butterflies in my stomach, I thought, well, if stuff really goes bad, I'll get the chalk because I love to write and teach. You know? <laughs> and uh, I started teaching for this hospital and teaching about our disease and going out to business and industry and talking to folks who didn't know anything about alcoholism and, and talking about uh, how... I had come back and how other people can come back and, and all that I can say is that, um, that I knew after a number of months is that I was where I was supposed to be and that was five years ago and I will tell you that sober alcoholics and this sober alcoholic uh, trying to live in my work life by our set of principles and by our steps uh, can be very successful people. In those five years I was promoted five times. your wildest dreams can come true in this program. I had uh, given up the idea of marriage. I was an Irish guy who was past 40. That basically disqualifies you <laughs> from marriage. Um, the, the dirty bachelor tricks that I had brought into my life uh, were honed to such a fine edge that I was afraid to really show them to, to anybody, especially a woman, especially someone who I cared about. And um, I met, I met my wife uh, a couple of years ago um, in an AA group in Kansas City and we met under the most wonderful of circumstances and I think we met in the way that the best marriages in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and other places are made. Uh, we met and we became friends. And ours was a friendship that caught fire. And today it's a marriage. The, the woman uh, from California with the infant daughter uh, is also a friend today. And the infant daughter uh, who I wanted to walk in the stroller like other people um, is six foot tall, has flaming red hair, and is a freshman uh, at San Francisco State in California. Uh, she's one of my best friends. Um, She's been given back to me because of you. God has allowed me the privilege of paying for her education. And for someone who has lived a life like mine, it's a privilege to pay for her education. The, um, the relationship of my original family, and, and my dad died early, and my mom um, had been restored to me, and and last spring, right around this time, I got the opportunity to go back and to, to be a son to my mother as she went through the last months of her life. And we had uh, some really beautiful, good times together. And she was dying, and I was sad, but it was okay. You know? And that's because of you, that I could act like a sober man with death in my family. Um, the relationships that have been taken away from me, as it says in some of our stories in our book, have all been restored to me 100% and more. The, uh, the dreams that I have had as a kid uh, have materialized in my life today. Uh, the most beautiful thing, I think, is that when we were driving over here tonight and Cotton and I were talking, and, and, and it's what's so, so beautiful about you all being here tonight, is that these things have happened to me and they've happened to you and they have happened because we have come together we have come together to work our program of recovery. We have come together to love one another 
where others could never love us. We have come together here this evening in fellowship assembled to show our gratitude towards God and towards one another and towards the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for what we all have today. For what I have, I'm grateful to you and to God and to Alcoholics Anonymous. And for what we have, we can never repay uh, what's been given us. Thank you so very much.